Self-supervised learning is one of the most exciting areas of deep learning research that's probably making the most rapid progress. This is where you construct these supervised loss functions and these supervised learning tasks from unlabeled data. And then you can scale up this representation learning on a massive amount of data because you don't have to manually label it. In this paper, they're gonna test this experiment and this contrastive clustering algorithm with billions of Instagram images, which would take a long time to manually be annotating. So there are three popular ways of doing self-supervised learning with images. There is auxiliary tasks like rotating the images and then uh, predicting how much they've been rotated or colorizing a grayscale image. Then there's generative techniques where you might use a GAN to the generator generates data, the discriminator classifies this data, and then you might have some way of also learning a vector representation of that data that's then repurposed for something like image net classification. But contrastive learning, which is what's used in this paper, is kind of been the most successful way of doing this. It's where you form these positive pairs by applying two data augmentation transformations of an image, and then you try to make those representations as similar to each other as possible, while dissimilar to other images that are either in the sampled mini batch or some kind of queue or memory bank that's being used to store these uh, negative example encodings. But this strategy from researchers at Facebook AI combines clustering with contrastive learning in order to make this more computationally efficient. So you don't have to do this negative comparison with all these other images in some large mini batch or dictionary. So what they do is they map these feature encodings into a discrete code book of clusters. And then you use the features from one of the positive views to predict the code book or the code of the cluster of the other view of that same image. So we'll get more into the details of exactly how this works, what it's tested on and how it compares with other contrastive self-supervised learning algorithms. This video will explain the latest and greatest in contrastive self-supervised learning, unsupervised learning of visual features by contrasting cluster assignments from researchers at Facebook AI. This image is an interesting example of why we might be interested in contrastive self-supervised learning versus generative modeling. If you ask somebody to draw a dollar bill, unless you're someone who's particularly good at this and has really memorized a dollar bill, you're most likely to draw something like this. And this idea is kind of saying that our representations of objects are just enough to distinguish them from other objects. We only represent a dollar bill enough to know it's a dollar bill and not a cat or a coffee cup. And we don't exactly store the full representation and we're not able to do this full reconstruction of the dollar bill. So this is kind of the idea of contrastive learning, just learning to tell objects apart from one another compared to a generative modeling, which might be like an auto encoder with some kind of like L1 pixel reconstruction loss on this dollar bill. And instead, we just need this kind of representation to you know, successfully understand this concept of a dollar bill. This table illustrates the progress of contrastive self-supervised learning and how it's catching up to full supervised learning constrained to the ResNet 50 architecture. So you see this new algorithm, the contrastive clustering from these researchers at Facebook AI that we're going over now is within one percentage point of full supervised learning on the ImageNet classification task. And you see the progression, the momentum contrastive learning, SimCLR, and then the prototypical contrastive learning from researchers at Salesforce, which also uses this kind of contrastive clustering idea, uh, contrastive predictive coding and other algorithms, up to this uh, big buy GAN is an example of a generative uh, self-supervised learning task that also learns representation. We see that the performance of that model is uh, about 20% less than this contrastive clustering algorithm. And then some auxiliary task examples like colorization and jigsaw, these are like forming some kind of task that you get the label from the task and the data and then you learn a representation by say predicting the rotation angle but another interesting thing about this is that this table is constrained to this resnet uh, 50 architecture but you see papers like SimCLR note that these uh, algorithms really benefit from larger models and in their case larger batch sizes because they're doing this negative example comparison within the batch so they need a large batch size as well but you see that you can scale this up as well and get even better performance than constraining it to the ResNet 50. So a lot of these contrastive learning algorithms that have been successful in the past are based on instance discrimination, where, for example, in the SimCLR framework, we take an image and then we apply two different data augmentation transformations to it, and then we're maximizing the similarity as these two uh, images, augmented images, go through the feature representation learning network. So we're doing this to contrast the positive examples and the negative examples. And then in momentum contrastive learning, we have a more clever way of structuring the negative example batch where we have this momentum encoder 
where the latest encoded negative examples go onto the top of this queue. And this queue lets you get around having these massive batch sizes that you need in something like uh, SimCLR. And then bootstrap your own latent is kind of a move in this direction towards this latest paper, Contrastive Clustering, where they just do the uh, comparison of the positives with the neural network and then a running average of that same neural network's weights and then the two views of the image and then they just compare these representations. And this, they don't use negative examples, so they're, and it surprisingly does work pretty well. So that's kind of moving into this direction where we're not having these uh, massive negative examples in the mini batches to do this kind of representation learning. And so just another note, this framework has been successful in reinforcing learning as well. When you do things like OpenAI Gym or the DeepMind Control Suite, uh, trying to do control from a visual input, you can take those stacks of frames and then have this auxiliary self-supervised learning task. And that learns a better representations of the high dimensional images that then facilitate learning a policy or a value function for some kind of reinforcement learning task. The paper we're focusing on this video, Contrastive Clustering, has a really nice background and overview of some of the previous state-of-the-art approaches to contrastive representation learning. They describe how the contrastive loss removes the notion of instance classes by directly comparing image features. So this first part is saying that it has this kind of Siamese architecture framework of setting up the problem. It's not like you take as input x1 and x2 and then map this into some like say you would stack these images on each other, uh, like on the channel axis and just and then just pass that tensor through a, a convolutional network and then just have a classification network as these two images go through the same network. Rather they have this Siamese where you copy the network twice or you have some kind of running average of this network and then you compare the features themselves. So these are these vector representations, the features that are then repurposed for say, policy mapping and reinforcement learning or repurposed for image net classification. And then the second part of the description of the top is that the data augmentations define the invariances encoded in the features. So we have these manually designed inductive priors that we're giving into this algorithm where we're saying that a rotated image of a cat is still a cat, you know, shift the color histogram, zoom in on it, what have you, it's still an image of a cat. The semantics haven't been changed. So that's how we're encoding the invariances that these features are going to uh, capture by doing this loss function with these two different uh, data augmentations. And they note that this full instance discrimination task is not practical com computation wise. So they approximate it by doing these random mini batches or these uh, like some kind of finite length queue. Researchers from Salesforce also tried out a technique that combines contrastive learning with clustering with their paper prototypical contrastive learning with the key difference between the two algorithms being the ways in which they're forming these clusters and then the granularity of the clusters themselves. But in this paper, they have these two criticisms of current approaches to instance discrimination and contrastive learning like SimCLR or uh, momentum contrastive learning. So they first know that the instances could be discriminated by exploiting low level cues. And this is kind of like uh, adversarial examples or features, not bugs, showing that, you know, these high frequency features that to us, they're not semantic features, they're just like these uh, like static pixel patterns that are impossible to uh, actually interpret as a human, but you know, they can be used to perform these kind of tasks. And then they note that images from the same class, like two cats in this task are treated as different instances because uh, they're not data augmentation views of the same image. And therefore their embeddings are pushed apart in this loss. And this is undesirable because images that share similar semantics should have similar embeddings. So this kind of idea that you're making the data augmentation views of the same image as similar to each other as possible, is probably more likely to use these high frequency uh, features in the data that is undesirable with these representations. So now transitioning into the algorithm that's the focus of this video is the swapping assignments between views or the contrastive clustering uh, self-supervised learning algorithm. So the idea here is that we take the image and then similar to SimCLR, we form two augmented views of that same image. We pass this through the feature encoder. And then the difference is now that we have our features, we're not just gonna compare these features with each other. Rather, we're going to map the features to their nearest neighbor in a set of clusters. So this is a discrete code book of this set of clusters that our features are going to be mapped into. And this is a finite length uh, cluster code book, and we're using it to look up the codes that are most similar to the features. So now the idea is that from this code, from code uh, Q1, from this augmented view of the image, you should be able to predict the features of this image. So you're using this code 
to predict this feature and this code to predict this feature. And in doing this, there's a little more details about exactly how they're gonna do the, uh, design the code book, particularly so they don't just map all features to the same code, which would be like this obvious solution where you, do, you just predict this one code because all the images map to this one code. So they're going to use this thing called optimal transport and this sync horn nap algorithm to uh, have this kind of balancing in the uh, in the code book. So just to quickly illustrate this idea again, here's the animation from the Facebook AI research blog. You have the two views of the image and then you encode them, project those features onto a unit sphere, and then you put uh, those features into the code book and then get the nearest cluster. And then you use that cluster to predict the other views uh, features. So just to quickly contrast this with uh, the prototypical contrastive learning framework, in case you're interested in doing research in this kind of contrastive learning and clustering, the difference here is that they are uh, marginalizing over these clusters and treating that as a latent variable compared to the kind of uh, differentiable matrix of code books that actually is going to get this loss function in as a part of this contrastive clustering algorithm that we're covering in this video. But another detail of this PCL algorithm is that they have like a granularity to the cluster. So they have like a higher level cluster, like a coarse grain cluster that might cover like animals compared to vehicles. And then they have more fine grain, grain clusters like uh, horses, cats, dogs within the animal cluster. So it's a bit more nuanced. I think kind of this algorithm is a bit more complex. I don't fully understand this algorithm compared to the one described in this paper. Although the optimal transport part is a bit confusing, it's kind of a bit simpler than this one is. Before we take a shot at the math behind the online clustering using this algorithm, this is the quick motivation behind why we want an efficient way of doing clustering. So clustering, this is an image about where you have all these data points in a two dimensional space and you're trying to find the centroids that summarize the data, or in our case, say these are all the image features from encoding like a batch of images. And then you want to form the discrete codes that we're using to predict the features in the other view of the image. But clustering these uh, images, like the k-means clustering algorithm, that could take a long time with these 2048 dimensional feature vectors. And then this is a self-supervised learning algorithm. The whole point of it is to scale up to a massive scale of images. Like, say you have a self-driving car that drives around and collects all this data. You want to be able to efficiently learn representations from that unlabeled data. So you don't want to spend all this time finding these centroids. So now we're in the paper looking at the formulation of the online clustering. So we have the task of this swapped prediction problem where we have the loss on the feature and the code. So this might be the feature of image one and then the code of uh, image two or feature two that was used to predict this feature. So we have this loss function where we have this kind of softmax thing on predicting these codes. So the codes are denoted in this matrix C. This is the C is the code book where we have uh, these set of prototype vectors or clusters, codes, uh, whatever we're calling them. So we're mapping this into uh, mapping our features into these codes. So we have the prototype matrix C that we're using to map with features. And we want to make sure this is balanced. So it doesn't just map all the features onto this same code because you know, that would be like an obvious easy solution for the neural network. So what they do is they use this uh, optimal transport thing, which is the way of taking this batch of feature vectors and then most efficiently uh, sending them to the different prototypes in the matrix that would, uh, you know, balance the distribution and the assignment in the code book, but doing it in a way that isn't like going to destroy the code book because you're just arbitrarily enforcing them to go map to some different prototype vector. So then this uh, matrix C is differentiable and you update the prototypes as well. So they don't just stay fixed as this one discrete vector. So the math is a bit tricky and I don't fully understand it, but they have some great links you can look to. And then at the end of the paper, they uh, show their implementation of the Sinkhorn NOP algorithm for how they uh, actually do this kind of transport. Another interesting contribution to the paper is the multi-crop augmentation. So they use the full resolution of the images in the data set to form the codes, but they use these more zoomed in views of the image to do the contrastive learning loss. So they use the zoomed in view of the image and compare it with a more global view of the image. And they show an ablation on how uh, doing this kind of zoomed in cropping leads to better performance compared to just uh, comparing two crops of the 
original full resolution of the image. As shown earlier, these are the results of this new algorithm and the table of progression in self-supervised learning when you take the representations and then learn a linear mapping into ImageNet classification. And they also show that even though this table is constrained to the ResNet 50, they show further gains as you increase the number of parameters. And they show that, say, uh, as the SimCLR algorithm also improves with more parameters, they continue to outperform that algorithm. And the SimCLR algorithm would get better because it's using this large batch of negative examples as the model is getting larger, but even this clustering algorithm continues to uh, outperform it. So here's another evaluation on pre-training on uncurated data. So in this case, they're using 1 billion random Instagram images. And this is different from, you know, ImageNet where they're manually labeled and, uh, you know, it's not just random images. And this is showing kind of this motivation behind self-supervised learning on massive amounts of uh, like data in the wild. And you see the performance gains on this algorithm compared to SimCLR when you just freeze the features and then when you fine tune them by uh, tuning all the parameters on the downstream image net task and you see a gain from uh, going from random features into fine tuning from this starting point representation which is kind of this interesting curriculum learning stepping stone representation learning thing where this is about a percentage point higher then training on ImageNet from random initialization. This table is showing the results of transfer learning from this representation onto other classification tasks aside from ImageNet and object detection as well, using this uh, representation as the feature backbone for one of these object detection networks, whether it's faster RCNN or the uh, Detter model, which is this kind of set transformation uh, way of doing object detection. And they also show the results of doing semi-supervised learning, which is another really interesting way of evaluating these algorithms. The SimCLR version two paper is exploring starting off with SimCLR, then doing supervised fine tuning on the smaller set of data that has that is manually labeled, and then using this self-training knowledge distillation thing with the same architecture to use the unlabeled data and continue this kind of representation learning that starts off from this contrastive self-supervised learning. So it'll be interesting to see more papers that kind of take on this pipeline of adapting their representations to the downstream task rather than just doing this kind of linear evaluation of the representation that really doesn't mean too much. Supervised contrastive learning is another interesting paper that shows a way of adapting these representations for downstream tasks. They start off with the contrastive self-supervised learning, then they adapt it by doing the same kind of loss, but within the semantic classes. So the positives are the dogs, and then the negatives are the cats, or like every other class in the task. And so that would be one way of adapting these representations. And this might be a more efficient way of doing it than this kind of phase of self-training and knowledge distillation. Thanks for watching this overview of the contrastive clustering algorithm from researchers at Facebook AI. I hope from this video, you got a decent sense of all the other contrastive learning algorithms like SimCLR and Momentum Contrastive Learning and kind of how they all relate to each other and sort of an introduction to this idea of adding clusters to contrastive self-supervised learning. I hope at the high level idea of the algorithm was clear from this video, this kind of idea of uh, predicting features from these codes and using these two local and global views of the same image to do so, although the math of this is a bit tricky and we didn't get into that and I don't fully understand it myself, this optimal transport and exactly how the Syncorn knob algorithm is used to balance out this code book and make it so uh, it doesn't just map all the features to the same code or use the same code throughout the whole matrix or something like that. But anyways, I hope the video gave a decent introduction to it and maybe motivated further interest into contrastive clustering algorithms and self-supervised representation learning. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.